you know, sometimes you have the skill set and you don't recognize, you know, what else is up there out there and what else you can you can do with that skill set. Business of Architecture, episode 312. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. It's my pleasure today to have a developer on the show, someone who's deeply integrated and passionate about the built environment, which I know that as my audience of architects here, you are probably have that shared interest. Tanya Reagan is based out of Dallas, and she's really making a huge impact over there in revitalizing the center of Dallas and really taking a stand and doing something pretty cool. So we're going to get to hear a bit about her journey, about how she's able to achieve that. And just a bit of background on Tanya Reagan. She's a commercial real estate investor, and currently she serves as president of Wildcat Management, which is her development company. She originally is from Minnesota, but relocated to Dallas in 2005 and has lived downtown for over 13 years. She owns several properties in the Farmer's Market District, and she recently Uh, Her latest project is called the Purse Building, which is a 113-year-old building being transformed into a modern hub for innovation, technology, and creative professionals. Really a key cornerstone of revitalizing that part of downtown Dallas. It's six stories, 70,000 square foot building, and it's going to include retail space on the first floor uh, below five stories of office space. In today's episode, you'll hear not only her path about how she ended up in real estate development, she's also going to tell us about some of the challenges of developing buildings in the urban core and her tips for architects who would like to work with developers and do those kind of projects. So without further ado, here is Tanya Reagan on the Business of Architecture on today's show. Welcome, Tanya, to the Business of Architecture. Hi there. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm so glad to have you on here as a developer. We uh, got to admit, we don't have a whole lot of developers come on the show. We've had them in the past. I'd really like to know from you, Tanya, for you, what does development mean to you? You know, I have, I think, a little bit different approach. Um, You know, I'm inspired and passionate about uh, local development, Uh, small, local urban, very, very community driven. I think that it's important to have a balance. Certainly, you know, I'm all for progress, very much pro-economic development, but also keeping the balance of the history, the community fabric. And um, it's important for me and for Wildcat to be heavily, heavily engaged. Um, both in the community and make sure that our projects or hope that our projects um, really, really have a a positive impact on those communities, not change them. I'm hearing that the the impact of your projects is really important and not just the bottom line. Do you find that this is something that's common with your peers, other developers that you run across, or is this unique? Well, I think, you know, I think sometimes it also has to do with the maybe the phase or the point of where that neighborhood or that community or that city is in, um, in their development progress. Uh, you know, for myself, I've been downtown Dallas for going on 14 years, you know, 14 years ago, things were very, very different downtown. Uh, you know, it was a little bit of a sleepy area. You didn't see a lot of activity after 5 PM and really, in order for projects to get done, it really, really required local people um, that often were already very community connected to make that investment and to, um, you know, push those projects through, you know, flash forward 14 years, you know, today it's a very, very different story. You have, you know, you have billion dollar, you know, development companies, very, very large players that have moved in and, you know, things have changed. So I think for myself, you know, I'm one of the, I'm probably one of the few that are, that are still around down here um, of my size, just because, you know, the way things have changed, a lot of, a lot of the uh, smaller guys have been bought out or the mover guys, the larger guys have, have moved in. Um, You know, certainly as a smaller, uh, as a smaller local developer, you're able to, I think, um, you know, be much more conscious of costs. 
However, you don't necessarily have all the projects that you can do the spread either. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, the economics either work or they or they don't work. Um, no matter how passionate you are or how, how much you love a community or a neighborhood or a project, um, you have to, you know, you have to stay in business and the economics have to work. But uh, being small and nimble, you're, I think we're able to, you know, we're able to adapt and flex when we, when we need to and when things change. What do you feel that it is that is your secret sauce that separates you from other developers out there? Well, I, you know, I can speak for, you know, downtown Dallas. I think something that makes, makes me and makes Wildcat very, very unique is, you know, downtown is, is my 24 seven environment. I live downtown. I work downtown. I play downtown. You know, my home is, um, about a mile from my office. I walk a lot and I'm, I'm heavily engaged with, the lifestyle of um, being in the urban core and being downtown. And that's really, really unusual. You know, when I look at my peers and I look at, you know, a lot of the other developers that are, you know, that are, are, are downtown, you know, they, they don't live here. They, you know, live in the suburb or they live somewhere else or they come to their office and they go into a parking garage and take the elevator up to their, you know, to their, um, to their high rise floor. You know, I think it gives me a very, very different perspective because I am so hands-on and so on the, on the ground. Um, I think that it gives me a little bit of an advantage in some areas because I can, I see things as they're starting to shift sometimes, um, being so actively engaged with the community and the folks that are um, either leasing my space or patroning my uh, tenants. You know, I, I think that that, um, I certainly think that that's something that is both unique and that works to, uh, to my advantage. You know, the negative is, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to strike a balance um, you know, you tend to be on 24 seven because you're always in work mode because you're, you're, you're surrounded by it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do feel that that is something that, um, sets me apart. Also, you know, I'm, I'm a woman and, you know, there are not a lot of women in commercial development. There's certainly not a lot of women in construction. So not only do I live, work and play, in the urban core, this is my 24 seven environment, but I'm also a woman in a very heavily, uh, you know, male industry. So those are a couple of the things that um, set me apart. Also, you know, Wildcat is very, very engaged in the community. Uh, we're very active with our city. I serve on and have served on several boards and commissions. I was heavily involved with the privatization of um, an area of downtown that had our historic um, city-owned farmer's market, which has now been privatized and developed. Uh, you know, so heavily involved during the day with our projects and with my business, but, you know, often in the evenings, you know, heavily involved with our city and things that are happening in the community to, you know, to improve and make our city better. Where would you say that your passion for the built environment comes from? You know, I think I've always had a strong sense of community. I also certainly love being around a team. I love being around people who um, who inspire me. I think it's very important to um, give back and to improve the community that you you know, that you live in, you know, I think, think back to even at a young age, you know, I just have always grown up and always been very, very um, actively involved in the community. And I think when I first moved to Dallas, you know, back in 2004, 2005, you know, I was coming from a, a corporate environment and had spent, you know, the last decade plus in a, in a corporate environment. And you know, when I moved to Texas and 
started my own business and, you know, went out and started working uh, in, in different capacities with uh, city planning or with various projects, I missed sort of that feeling of a team environment that I had working in consulting and working for corporate. So I think it just sort of organically happened where when I started acquiring property and putting together real estate in some of these areas that were, I would say, depressed or very transitional, (laughs) you know, there was this feeling of being able to go out and, you know, sort of organize the various stakeholders and property owners. In some cases, you know, some of these property owners were businesses or industry that were multi-generational, you know, going back to the farmer's market, you know, the farmer's market had been in downtown Dallas for, you know, 90 some years and you had produce businesses and um, mom and pop shops that were third and fourth generation. And, you know, they had, they owned their property and owned their businesses and were struggling to get by, you know, being able to come in and, you know, sort of a bit of an outsider, right. But, you know, come in and, you know, work with these property owners to organize and begin, um, you know, reviving that area of downtown, you know, I just found it incredibly rewarding. And in my case, it was sort of almost like, again, having, having that, that team aspect that I, I sort of missed from, from the corporate side. Tanya, I'd love to hear about the story of the first project that you acquired. How did you get into development? You know, it's really interesting. When I first uh, moved to Texas and I was going out on my own, um, I initially was working on putting together oil and gas prospects. And I was working heavily in some of the rural areas around uh, Fort Worth and Tarrant County. And going in and acquiring land, uh, drill sites, and piecing together acreage with the intent to explore and to drill. And in a lot of those areas, the title work was very, very messy. It was complicated. And, you know, it, it's, it's sort of evolved into the real estate naturally because as you're working these areas, you know, you're working very, very closely with a number of property owners and, you know, you're assembling the acreage as sort of a larger track and you go through the whole process of building the relationship, uh, certainly working through all the terms of their leases, um, you know, ultimately pushing to have some of that land drilled. And what sort of evolved was, you know, some of these property owners several months later, they would all of a sudden maybe have some of their land drilled and they'd be receiving income and be receiving checks. And then they decide, hey, you know, maybe now that I've got money, some of this money coming in, I think I want to (laughs) move. So, you know, six months, a year, all of a sudden out of the blue, I started getting phone calls from, you know, in property owners that I had developed a relationship with and, you know, as a business had leased, you know, some of their, their mineral rights and some of their um, oil and gas. And all of a sudden they decided they wanted to sell. Well, they knew that they liked me. They knew that I had uh, performed, you know, they, um, they were receiving income and decided that they wanted to, they wanted to sell their land. So I started receiving these phone calls from folks that were, you know, Hey, I know you've done all the title, you know, I like you. I'm curious, would you be interested in buying the land? So I started buying the land. And, you know, what's really interesting is some of these areas, you know, they were um, areas that were, I I would say, semi-rural, but they also were growing rapidly. And the money that was being generated and being pumped back into some of those cities was being turned around and putting new roads and putting schools and police and fire and, you know, it really helped turn, you know, I don't want to say turn around, but it really increased the, um, the viability of some of these, these towns and you could see it coming. So, uh, 
I turned around and started buying real estate. And ultimately, that's what brought me downtown Dallas. I had someone that I had worked with um, over the course of a couple of years um, that I had worked with in the oil and gas in acquiring or leasing some of their land. And one day they called me about some property they were interested in selling in Fort Worth. And as I was buying that property, they said, hey, by the way, I also own a couple pieces of land downtown Dallas. Maybe you'd be interested. Well, I was interested and I ended up buying the properties and that's what brought me downtown. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting looking back sometimes. I think that, you know, when you graduate, when you go to college and you graduate from college and in my case, you know, I wanted to work for corporate America and climb the corporate ladder. I think that, you know, sometimes you build a skill set that can be applied in a lot of different areas and a lot of different avenues. And, you know, sometimes you just don't know where life's going to take you. (laughs) It sounds like, so in this case, it was like that for you is what I'm hearing is that you set out on a particular path and kind of followed the string and it ended up to where you are now. Yeah. And, you know, you know, with, with, oil and gas or with the real estate, you know, it's a natural progression. You're still dealing with, um, you know, you're dealing with property owners, you're dealing with the city, you're dealing with planning, you're dealing with permitting, you're dealing with, um, certainly with environmental, um, you know, with title, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of similarities. So it's a natural, it's a very, very easy transition. Tell me about your first project. When so you have these land, you you acquired some property in downtown Dallas. Did you have plans for them when you purchased them, or were you just holding the carrying costs, or how did you manage that aspect? You know, uh, when I when I looked at the property downtown, you know, my initial plan was to acquire uh, the entire block, and I had the entire block under under contract. You know, I I was sort of looking at it from the outside, and I'm looking downtown, and I'm thinking, God, there's this there's this area of town. It's got this historic, you know, farmer's market. The market is struggling, but there's a cool factor. And if, if you look across the country, you know, this is, these farmer's markets are very, becoming very, very popular. People are eating healthier. Young people are interested in eating healthier. There's a cool factor with the history. Uh, certainly people like to move around. There's the walkability aspect. And you looked at this side of down or the farmer's market area of downtown, which is located on the southeastern side. You know, there's available land that literally is you know, three blocks from the core, it's a few blocks from city hall. And it's just sort of, it's just sort of sitting here like a diamond in the rough. How is this still available? So, you know, I felt that there was incredible upside potential and, you know, I, I couldn't figure out why there wasn't more happening with it. So I felt that there was a tremendous amount of opportunity, um, in, ahead and in the future for the side of downtown or for that side of downtown. So, you know, that is really what motivated me to start to make the investment and start acquiring the property. I ended up purchasing the property. And shortly after I purchased the property, I got a real education (laughs) of what all was, you know, happening in that area of town and downtown and the politics and the city and you know, it certainly was a fast and big education of, um, of an urban environment of some of the challenges, but, um, you know, things certainly don't happen overnight, but, um, you know, over the course of the last 10 years, we really, we've been able to, uh, you know, turn this area around and really see the results of, um, of, of progress today and, and, and continuing to happen in, in the future. But, you know, I would say that there was a, there was definitely a a big education process after I closed on that property um, and those properties, um, which ultimately is what led me to organize the area as a whole to, you know, I recognized after I closed on the property that some of the things that, you know, that I wanted to do with the property and some of the things that, you know, needed to be done to make to move the area forward were much, much larger than just me, that I was not going to be able to accomplish it on my own, which is ultimately what led me to um, 
to organize the neighborhood. Um, I went out, I knocked on doors, I got to know the neighbors, and we formed a uh, business association, actually a nonprofit uh, business association for this community with its entire mission statement uh, and, and goal to revive this side of downtown. So we formed the nonprofit, we organized the people, and we started lobbying, lobbying both on a local and state level to uh, revive, privatize both the farmer's market, but also um, allocate money to the neighborhood to uh, improve and to, and to revitalize. You talked about some of the lessons when you first purchased that property and you said, oh, this is like a world in education and in politics and urban urbanization. What was, what were some of those challenges? Well, let's see. Um, you know, shortly after, after I purchased the properties, one of the property had a, um, had an existing building on it and that building was vandalized, um, you know, graffiti, uh, theft, um, you know, downtown Dallas has, has struggled over the last 20 years with, uh, quality of life, homeless, um, you know, safety concerns, you know, being in the suburbs and being in some of these other markets, you know, those aren't things that you, uh, that you maybe are exposed to, or maybe if you, you know, if you are, it's a whole nother category in an urban environment. Um, so, you know, coming into downtown and making those purchases, it was like, you know, almost overnight, you know, starting to, to work through some of the challenges, especially in downtown that at that time was not vibrant. I mean, you know, the last 15 years, 14 years has been absolutely incredible, the change downtown. But, you know, 14, 15 years ago, you know, it was a ghost town. And after 5 p.m., you know, there was, um, it was, it was vacant. So, you know, coming in and acquiring some of that property, even though where I felt there was incredible opportunity, especially if you, if you had the community working together, you know, just, very, very challenging. And I think, you know, I think that is also what really led me to become so, uh, such an advocate for um, investing locally, you know, in urban areas or in, in the community in order for some of these areas really truly to turn around and to change. You need not only the participants with the community and with the residents, but you you need the local folks that are willing to make the investment. And you know you have to be diligent. I mean, all together you enforce. Uh, you know, if there's graffiti, and we see graffiti at seven a.m. in that in seven a.m. in the morning, that graffiti is removed by the afternoon. If there's broken glass, if there's damaged windows, I mean. You know, one thing I will say about downtown and the folks that have been involved with some of these areas, I mean, we are diligent and, you know, areas that are broken and run down and beat up, they continue to stay that way because they're run down, beat up and broken. When you've got folks that say, okay, we're going to work together and we're going to paint and we're going to make improvements and we're going to clean up and we're going to have crime watch and we're going to... You know, we're going to work to uh, keep our neighborhood and keep our area clean. It, it is amazing how working diligently can make those areas change. And I, I'm a firm believer of this because I've personally lived it. What do you think has been your secret sauce to making these deals happen and bringing all this together? You know, I think... Um, for one, I am, I am visible. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm, people can find me. Um, you know, I'm not operating remote at a distance. I'm not, you know, up in a, up in a, in a glass tower. You know, I'm, I'm on the ground and I'm very, very hands-on. You know, over the last couple of years, it's become more challenging to be that way, right? As you evolve and you grow and your business gets bigger, in order to continue to grow your business, you know, you have to be very, very um, 
you know, you have to be very much more selective with your time. That's something that I've, that I'm still continuing to try to work through. Uh, you know, time is our most valuable resources and in order to grow and, 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 um, you know, take on bigger and larger projects, you know, I can't allocate all the time maybe that I would like to, or that I have in the past, but I think early on, you know, that was sort of my secret sauce, you know, being actively engaged, attending community meetings, attending crime watch meetings, you know, showing up, you know, walking on the street and being accessible, um, you know, often my having ears to the ground, kind of being aware of some of the conversations and some of the things that are taking place, you know, early on, because I am so, um, I am so engaged. I think I really believe that that's sort of been my secret, my, my secret sauce, if you will. Um, you know, back to the live, work and play, you know, being very, uh, this is my 24 seven environment. I live downtown. I work downtown. I play downtown. You know, this is my community. I don't just build it. I don't just produce it. I don't just go out and find tenants to lease it. I am, I am those people. So it makes me also very, very relatable to either the tenants or the, uh, whether it's restaurant, retail office, you know, you know, I'm able to relate to them because, you know, I, I, I understand their business because that's, you know, that's who I am. Tanya, our, our audience is mostly made up of architects, designers, building professionals. Now, have you had the opportunity to interface with architects a lot or just with your scope of projects? Has it just been a few firms? Give me an idea of, of your experience working with architects in terms of how many you've had the opportunity to, to work with or or take a look at their proposals, et cetera? Um, quite a few, you know, depending on the different projects that, um, that we are involved in, you know, we've worked with everything from, um, you know, we've had architects, of course, do all the drawings. We've done new construction. We've done rehabs. You know, more recently, we've worked with, um, with historic architects, right? Preservation architects. You know, sometimes projects require multiple architects, whether you've got someone that's working very specialized on the preservation side, then you've got, you know, someone, you know, uh, that maybe works very, very focused on the restaurant side or the retail side. Um, you know, I guess we have used and have utilized a variety of different architects depending on what the project is. Uh, you know, our most recent project, uh, you know, is a historic project that's on the National Registry. It's both a local historic landmark and a uh, national landmark. You know, in that particular case, we work with a preservation architect that we've had to bring in to, you know, identify, you know, what we can and cannot um, do to the exterior, uh, you know, working through this project also qualifies for uh, historical tax credits, going through the entire application process with both the state and the Fed to, you know, archive and to, uh, to um, basically create a history of everything with that property. You know, we brought in a uh, historian that went through the whole process for our filing, working very, very closely with the preservation architect, um, to identify everything historically significant with that building. Well, then you've got the, you know, the, the uh, architecture firm that specializes specifically in restaurants. Well, we want to put a restaurant in the first floor of the space. So now we've got the restaurant architect working with the preservation architect, working with the building architect. It's a lot of complexity <laughs> there, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you know, especially with architects, you know, they are, um, you know, they're, they're very, very um, detailed and, and very, very passionate creatively. So you can imagine when you've got these sort of special niche areas and you're trying to get everybody uh, together, sometimes it can be, um, it can be, it, it can be challenging. It can be a little complicated. <laughs> I can imagine. What, what tips would you have for our listeners in terms of the way you've seen architects present themselves during the kind of the process where they're engaging a new client? Do you have any, any tips for things that you've seen architecture firms that they, they didn't do very well 
And then examples maybe that you know of, or, you know, this did impress me and they, they did well here. Well, I work with uh, one of the architects that I work with locally here on the preservation side as an as a architectist. Uh, the principal is Craig Maldi, and he is somebody that I have worked with for probably close to a decade on different projects. And, you know, one of the things that I like about that particular firm is um, certainly, you know, Craig is an absolute uh, preservationist, but he also understands the economics. And I think sometimes that can be very, very challenging on these projects. You know, you've got a building that's a historic building and is sat empty for 30, 40, 50 years. And, you know, it's, it's maybe, it's maybe held on with a lifeline of not being, of being torn down, right? We have another project that's a historic project that we actually relocated. We picked up and moved uh, several city blocks to save it from destruction. So, you know, you see a lot of these old buildings get torn down and get destroyed because, you know, trying to rehab them or get them either up to the city code or make the economics work. It's cheaper just to tear them down and start fresh and build new than it is to try to go in and get them, you know, get them completed. Uh, You know, one of the, one of the things that's really important to me and to Wildcat is to work with a firm that understands you still got to make the economics work. So, you know, in the case of a historic building, um, and some of the projects that I that I've just previously mentioned, you know, in a perfect world, you know, you you would like to see everything happen that maybe the architect designs or he draws or you know to take it back to 110 percent its original. But the reality is, at the end of the day, in order for that project to be viable and in order for that project to work, you have to make the economics work. So you know, sitting down with you know with a group or with with you know someone like um, Architexas who understands that and you know there's some give and take. At a certain point, sometimes there has to be compromise in order to save that project and to make that project work. And, you know, I think sometimes from the design avenue, you know, sometimes, you know, there can be such a push for everything to be perfect or everything to be uh, design significant or everything, you know, things to be, um, you know, extra special or overly creative or, and I'm all for creative, right? But again, you know, it's, the numbers have got to work. And in my experience, if I'm dealing with with a firm that um, is not able to compromise or isn't able to uh, make some of those revisions or make some of those changes, it can be it can be incredibly frustrated and frustrating, and it just doesn't it doesn't tend to work. Um, and you could apply that even to you know some of the other um, you know ar- architecture um, areas that I mentioned. You know, if you're in the business of going in and, um, you know, rehabbing some of these urban buildings, you've just got to, uh, you got to work with what you've got. And there's only so much you can do. You know, if you've got a building that's historic and it's six stories and you're in a historic district, you can't just go in and say, okay, we're going to go vertical or we're going to expand on this end or we're going to knock this wall out or we're going to shift this. Those things can't happen. So you got to work with what you got. Tandy, is there, is there any question that, that I haven't asked you that you wish I would have? Oh, any question that I wish you would have, um, you know, possibly, um, maybe focus, focus a little on the, um, urban revival and, um, maybe, uh, you know, some of the challenges of working in an urban environment and with a, with a, you know, with a, with the city planning. Okay. Well, do you have time left to tell me about that or shall we call it a wrap? Would you like to dive into that a little bit or do you feel like you've got your, uh, (laughs) Well, we'd love to hear you it. If that's, that's an important question. Yeah, we'd love to hear what your take is on that. You know, I think that um, one of the challenges also with an urban core is that, you know, 
some of these outer suburbs and some of these outer areas that are growing, they've become very, very easy to work with. You know, you're going into these areas where they're uh, very collaborative and very cooperative. And, you know, they, they, they miss that history and it certainly misses that cool factor, you know, but it's so easy to do business there. And, you know, something that, you know, I think is really, really important for urban revitalization with some of these cities is they've got to become more collaborative and they've got to become more willing to, um, I want to say compromise, but also um, think outside the box. You know, if there's a list of this is the 10 ways we do things, or these are these are these are these are the policies and procedures and the processes and anything outside of this, we just don't do. You know, we have to get more creative of thinking outside the box, or you know, people are are no longer going to want to want to um, work through some of these projects in the core. Um, the process with, um, you know, working with the with the city right now, especially even with these historic buildings, from the, you know, from the permitting process and from all the bureaucracy and all the steps that you have to go through to get stuff done, it's just, um, it can be expensive, it can be lengthy, and it can be, um, you know, it can be difficult for, you know, local urban groups, and. Um, you know, I, I hate seeing some of my peers, you know, flee to the suburbs or go to some of these areas because they think it's, uh, they think it's so much easier. So, you know, I'd like to see downtown Dallas and the urban area become, um, become a little bit more thinking outside the box. Awesome. Well, it seems like you're definitely trend setting in that area. Much congratulations on that, Tanya, all of your success. We, we wish you much success in the future. And Thank you for sharing your passion with us here on the business of architecture. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I, you know, I, I love the fact that there are, you know, there's a podcast and there is someone like you out there, you know, having these kind of conversations and, you know, breaking down the, the different areas of whether it's architecture or real estate development or the different avenues of business. I think that it really, um, I think it's important to to give exposure to, to the different avenues of the business. I think lots of times there's people out there maybe who are working in a certain area who maybe think that they have an interest in something else, but don't know quite how to either get educated on it or to um, get more informed or learn. And I think this is fantastic that you have an outlet to, uh, to help educate, um, people in the real estate and, um, design and architectural fields of, of what other opportunities there are. Because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes you have the skill set and you don't recognize, you know, what else is up there out there and what else you can, you can do with that skill set. Mm. Love it. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.